guys, I'm here, Beth Massey with Brian Benz. Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself. <coughs> so, uh, uh, Brian Benz, I act, actually, I'm actually based in Las Vegas, which is where we're recording this. This is your town. Uh, so yeah, I just drove in here, um, and uh, I've been working at Microsoft for about five years, uh, mostly on Java on Azure, which uh, has been increasingly getting easier uh, as we go. And uh, that's what I'm going to show you today. Cool. So, so we're going to talk a lot about Java, which I don't really know much about uh -huh. at all. So you're going to probably get a lot of interesting questions from your host today. Yes. So yes. What, what part of Java are we going to talk about? Like? Um, so we're going to talk about um, a couple of recent developments in the Java world, which are mostly um, MicroProfile, which is a microservices framework. Uh, it's uh, you know, everyone's got a way of implementing microservices, and this group, which is uh, part of the Eclipse Foundation, decided, hey, why don't we get together and figure out if we can make our microservices compatible with each other okay. by building them in a standard way. Cool. So okay. that's basically what MicroProfile is, is meant to do. Okay. Uh, and it's um, also implemented this thing called open tracing, which is a way of tracking your performance through from an end-to-end -end process that includes multiple microservices. Gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about those two things, uh, and I'm going to show you how you can actually run those on Azure, on container instances, and also um, one of our partners, Red Hat, uh, has an implementation of Kubernetes called OpenShift. I'm going to show you how to do that as well. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. All right. Let's get started. Okay. All right. So um, basically, uh, yeah, what's on this slide right now is a, um, a little snapshot of the community that is actually working with MicroProfile. Uh, some of them actually have, um, <laughs> they actually have implementations already created, okay. including uh, Red Hat. Red Hat is a, a microservice implementation called Thorntail. So they've taken the microprofile standard, okay. which is the Eclipse agreed upon standard, and they've made a reference implementation of it, and they've called it Thorntail. I love the names in the Java community. Yeah, I'm yeah. Jealous well, this, of those names. This is the only one that actually has some kind of cool name. All the other ones are like, uh, there is a Spring offering, which is just basically Spring microservices, okay. uh, and some other ones as well. But okay. yeah, this one's the only one that came together and said, hey, let's get a brand and a name. And So we got Thorntail, MicroProfile, yeah. I hear we have a couple Red Hat guys in the Twitch stream chat as well. So yes, that's yes. great. So welcome, welcome to everybody. James Faulkner. Thank you very much for being there. <laughs> And Aaron Wislang, who actually helped a lot with the, the demos I'm going to show today. I just want to give him a shout out awesome. as well. All right. So guys on the Twitch stream, make sure that you ask your questions yes. about Java and Red Hat. We have the experts here. Yep. Uh, so I did want to go over a little bit about MicroProfile. Uh, basically, there are three things that it started with, which is uh, context and dependency injection. That's a CDI2. What you're looking at on the screen right now, that's the bottom, the, the bottom row there. Okay. Uh, it started back in September 2016 with context and dependency injection, which is just basically a way of managing microservices, uh, and then JSON for reading JSON, and then processing uh, REST with JAXRS. Okay. And since then, they've, they've basically evolved and they added some new packages. Uh, and uh, the most recent one is October 2018. They added a newer version of Open Tracing. So that's why I'm going to show Open Tracing today as well, because it's right. sort of like the latest, coolest thing of the latest, coolest thing. Cool. Uh, microprofile. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, so Thorntail itself is, uh, the idea is it, it leverages a bunch of Java EE expertise out there. Um, it's an open standard, and as I mentioned before, so Thorntail is an implementation that actually implements uh, the standard that's been put together. Uh, so it's just a way of making things work. Uh, everything works through um, Palm XML, so it's Maven based, uh, and Maven Thorntail is the actual command you use, so Maven Thorntail run to actually run things. Um, and for those of you who haven't been working with Java, this might be a little foreign uh, in the audience, but um, I'll show you a little bit about how this actually works. In fact, let's just get into that now. I've yeah. got some things here. There's, there's things about uh, working with MicroProfile with Thorntail uh, in terms of uh, health probes and things like that, but I'll show a little bit more details of this fault tolerance and metrics and things later. We like real code, not slides. Yes, yes. That. Well, the main thing I want to show you, just before I get into the demo, <laughs> is um, to, you know, this is the whole reason behind MicroProfile. Jaeger. It's all I need to do to add Jaeger, <laughs> which is a implementation of the open tracing standard. OK. Um, all I have to do to add Jaeger is just add this dependency into my palm file. And it pulls all the right files in and makes it run for me. And then I can just run Jaeger and look at traces of my application. So. Open tracing, if I may get into my 
browser here. So Open Tracing is actually an implementation uh, that is open source out on GitHub, uh, and it's a way of tracking multiple microservices from end to end. So you've got this thing called a trace, which is basically I made a web app call, and then I've got 10 other microservices that do things like credit card processing, inventory processing, stuff right. like that. Uh, and each one of those is called a, um, a span. Okay. So the microservice itself generates a span when it runs and reports back to a log file, and that log file aggregates all those spans together into a trace. So you can figure out what's going on in each one of those microservices, is that what you're saying? Exactly, okay. exactly. So I'm just focusing on that part, but there's a ton of more features of MicroProfile that you can use, but uh, let's dive into that. Cool. So um, what I've got here is um, a command window most people are familiar with. Um, all I'm gonna do is run my application, which is basically uh, invoked by Maven Clean Thorntail Run. Uh, and as that fires up, it takes a minute or two, um, it actually will start up, uh, it generates a WAR file, okay. and then that WAR file gets used by uh, Wildfly, which is Red Hat's implementation, because we're using Thorntail here, Red Hat's implementation of the microservices standard, it's going to use Wildfly, which is micro, uh, basically uh, Red Hat's implementation of the Java app uh, server oh, okay, that gotcha. you can use for that as well. To do that, use a WAR file, and the, the WAR file actually files, fires up. Uh, and so we're doing a build and then a deploy, gotcha. and it's actually going to run on top of this. Cool. Now, while that's running, let me go. I'm going to show you something else. Um, I'm actually doing this all in Visual Studio Code. Uh, Visual Studio Code itself has several plugins you can use uh, to read YAML files. Uh, for those of you who haven't been familiar with Visual Studio Code, uh, it's an open source uh, free text editor that you can use. It's got a million extensions, and I've got about half a million of them <laughs> installed on my machine. Uh, so I can do things like. And it supports uh, multiple languages, and Java is yes, one of those that it supports. Uh, yeah, That's I cool. wanted to show that. So you can actually use this for uh, managing Java. It's not a full Java IDE, but it is a text editor, okay. and it's great for demos like this. So okay. that's what I use. Um, and it's good for like quick editing of, of files and things like that. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, and it's great for editing things like YAML uh, and uh, um, actual uh, markdown files as well, which is what this is. Uh, so while that's running, let's just check back to see if that finished. Yep, Thorntail is ready. All right, let's fire that up. So some people uh, in the audience <laughs> might be familiar with this. This yes. is the application that we uh, decided to build for this just because it's fun. Uh, it's Minesweeper, we call it Microsweeper. And you can find it on GitHub. Uh, on uh, B-Ben's Microsweeper demo. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's just a full Minesweeper application. On the back end, it actually uses You're doing uh, pretty good. Cosmos DB. I know. See, this is what happens. When I'm doing a demo, I'm trying to do it quickly. It doesn't work. Oh, wow. boy. You're super good. There oh, we go. Uh, All right. Uh, and you know, you do a couple of these. Oh, there we go. Uh, and uh, you get the idea here. So it's, it's Minesweeper. It's an application. Every time I finish a game, it writes over here uh, to the scoreboard. It also writes this in Cosmos DB on the back end. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's go in. And the next thing I want to do, so I built this application. This is a microprofile application that's sitting there running. Uh, now I want to trace this using open tracing. Okay. Uh, to do that, I'm going to use the Jaeger implementation. Uh, so let's go there. I'm going to use a Docker file for that. And this takes hardly any time at all to fire up. So Docker run, local machine again. So you're running everything locally here, right? Yes. All the microservices, yeah, everything is running yeah. locally. All exactly, right. where's Azure? Um, we're gonna get to Azure. <laughs> no, that's cool. Uh, but uh, right now, I just wanna show how this actually runs. Uh, and then we're gonna actually deploy this out to uh, Azure Container Instance. So this is Jaeger. So Jaeger is a way of visualizing traces, okay? Uh, so open tracing is the actual service, and as you can see here, there's nothing that's been found. Uh, so if we play over here with some more games of Microsweeper, there we go. You'll see a couple of traces in there in a minute. Each time that something is saved to the scoreboard, there's a trace that happens. <laughs> Another great game. Oh, there you go. I know. Okay. It's just, you know, and it, that's of course Murphy's Law. This, this isn't when you want the great games. But anyway. Um, all right, let's refresh this. So over here, we're actually going to find some traces. As you can see, Jaeger query is now lit up. 
So the basic traces you get are Jaeger queries, and um, Jaeger query is just something that actually runs and checks to see if Jaeger is running. Okay. And, uh, uh, it's like a health check. Yes, okay. basically. Um, and the, here's the. This is a trace. Um, actually, no, sorry. This is a span, and then the trace is this end-to-end -end thing. Uh, and basically, the way this graph works, and it's a very simple graph. This is the free version. There are other versions of open trace and implementations out there that you can use that are a little bit more robust, but this one's just the basic free one. Uh, and if this circle is larger, that means the actual uh, trace is taking longer. I see. If it's up higher, like this one, that means the actual span is taking longer. So oh, the whole end-to-end -end process. Okay. So that's what we're looking at here. So that's just basically uh, Jaeger running locally. And there's a bunch of environment variables you can set in Jaeger to actually um, display things a little more, uh, a little more granularly, uh, and I'm going to show that in a minute with some get the details. That we set up. Yes, yes. So let's go in. Let's continue on. So that's just running locally. Um, let's fire up a. I'll skip over the properties for now, and I'll show you a demo of those properties later. But the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to just take this. So in Visual Studio Code. I can fire up a window, a bash window. Let me just close that one because I already used that one. Uh, and basically, this is Windows subsystem for Linux. Okay, uh, so I, yeah, I'm, I I've only I've been at Microsoft for a while. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but uh, most people at Microsoft are not familiar with the Windows subsystem for Linux or or, um, or using Visual Studio Code for Java and things like that. I live in kind of a totally different world. Yeah. It's starting to starting to change, but for now it's it's sort of uh, a very uh, different from what most people are used to seeing when they're working with Azure. Um, and in this case, what I'm using here, I just hit it control back tick in Visual Studio Code, mm -hmm. and it actually fires up a Windows subsystem for Linux window inside my Visual Studio Code. Um, and that actually is a full implementation of Ubuntu Linux uh, bash running cool. on top of Windows. Uh, and you can run that from your command line. Uh, you can just open a window. Or if you have it already installed, you can actually set it up here and run it as well. It comes with Windows 10. Uh, it's free. It's right and, out of the box. Uh, yeah, it's out of the box. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, so basically, control back tick. I've got mine set up for Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, and then I can actually execute some commands. So let's go up here. I'm going to set some um, variables first. See, now, I mentioned Aaron before. I'm going to call Aaron out again. Aaron Wislang, thank you for setting up this particular script for this demo. He wrote it on a Mac. So okay. as you can imagine, when you run a batch script on Windows, it's harder. But if I use Windows Subsystem for Linux, I can just uh, fire this up. I set all the same environment variables and everything. So I'm actually in a bash environment. And cool. it works just as well as it would on, um, on, on the Mac. On the Mac, thank you. So we're going to create a resource group. Ba -ba 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 -ba. This takes a minute. So is a resource group like you mean like like an Azure resource group or is yes. it different? Yes, yeah, yeah, we're saying okay, an gotcha. Azure resource group. So there by the go. way, yeah. I'm doing all this cool. live from scratch, nothing pre-baked. Yeah, no, this is real. Uh, yeah, and uh, basically, that's what we wanted to show in this particular demo. Awesome. So uh, you're just you sending commands to Azure. Yes. Yeah, so right. I'm actually just right now sending commands to Azure through my Windows subsystem for Linux image. Okay. I've already logged into my Azure account. Uh, and it's set up. So I created a resource group, and then I set up an Azure Container Registry, which is a private registry you can use. Uh, people who work with Docker are probably familiar with Docker Hub. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a public registry. You can pay extra on Docker Hub to have private repos, which means you, just like GitHub, where you, you actually store uh, private uh, Docker files okay. that you have sitting there. Azure Container Registry is a paid service on Azure that you can use to actually store private containers as well. And the reason images why I want or like, yeah, yeah. private containers, yeah. private images. images. Okay. Uh, the reason why I want that is because I have a Cosmos DB connections and things built into this application that I don't necessarily want to share with the public. Right. Uh, yeah. So basically I set up an AZ uh, AZ ACR create will create the actual uh, ACR. Now this is a cool one. Let me start this off because it takes a couple minutes. So this is an AZ ACR build and this is built on top of Docker build. And what that does is it's actually going into, let me show you the Docker file here. This is actually, it's going to take a little while to run. Um, but while it's running, um, 
basically what it's going to do, it's going out to Maven and it's getting a JDK 8 from Maven, okay? Uh, and it's going to build some applications using some directories and things. It's going to build a Maven clean package for this. And then it repackages the whole thing after it's compiled using the OpenJDK 8 Alpine image. Okay. Okay. And this is what's called a multi-stage Docker file. And the reason why you want to use a multi-stage Docker file is uh, size. So the Alpine image of Java 8 is much smaller than the Maven image. You need the Maven image to actually run and build and compile all this stuff because you need Maven. Mm -hmm. uh, but then once, that, once that's done, the jar file itself, we just need a basic Java image to run. Okay. And the cool thing is, you don't need Java or Maven installed on your local machine because it's all pulling it from Docker. So it's pulling it from the Docker hub using the Im these images, Maven 354, and then OpenJDK 8 Alpine it's actually pulling those down. So if I wanted to, I didn't do it today, but if I wanted to, I could run this on my Azure shell. Um, for those of you who haven't seen this, shell.azure.com is uh, a pretty cool um, thing. Uh, it's actually a full bash environment uh, on Azure. That's there we cool. go. So it's taking a second to start. There we go. But uh, I have my Azure CLI on here. I have uh, Cloud Foundry. I have Terraform. I have all kinds of things built into this shell so that I can actually go out to shell.azure.com from any computer, from that dodgy computer in the hotel lobby, and I can actually do stuff here. That's and cool. This is the coolest thing. So I wanted to show this. Well, that other thing takes a couple minutes to run. So this is Visual Studio Code, an implementation hey, in shell. So I can actually do things. Here's the same code that I was working with. Where is it here? Uh, there we go. Here's the same code I was working with. You don't get all the, you know, the the uh, uh, interpretations of every file. Actually, it does. It does YAML. Uh, so it'll actually work with all the files here. And I could have actually run this technically from here as well, just as well as I could run it on my That's local cool. machine. Yeah. So this is actually some pretty cool stuff people might not know it's about. Right in the browser. Uh, and uh, by the way, there's an app on uh, Azure as well. You can use an iPhone app or an Android app, not to run code, but just to run the shell. So you can actually go into Azure Shell and do that as well. That's awesome. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and let's see here. All right. Um, from there, let's see what we got here. Hey, good, it's successful. So the actual build was successful. Let's go in and we got to continue on. That was the uh, slowest part of, the, of this demo, <laughs> cool. so good. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're actually going to get some credentials. Uh, so we're going to get some credentials here that actually uh, allow our Azure Container uh, registry to talk to an Azure Container instance. So there we go. That runs. Takes a millisecond. All right. Uh, and that should be real quick. All right, so that's done. Okay, so there's a little bit of a script in here for creating a single container instance, but what we want to create is actually a multi-container instance. So I'm using, I talked about Azure Container Registry. It's a private registry. We're actually going to deploy what we just built mm -hmm. into Azure Container Instance, Okay. which is a, if you're using something like Kubernetes to run your applications, that's great, but it takes a lot of work uh, and maintenance and a management plane and load balancers and stuff like that. An orchestrator. Yes, well, orchestrator. orchestrator. So right. we, have, okay. we have Azure Kubernetes service, which is great. Uh, but if you just want to do like a little test or maybe a demo on a live stream, uh, then um, we have this thing called Azure Container Instance. Okay. And one of the things I learned actually recently about this, um, hat tip to Aaron again, is um, that you can, I was picturing Azure Container Instance as something that just runs one container at a time. Okay. And if you, so if I wanted to con connect my MicroSweeper application that I showed you mm -hmm. to my Jaeger application, I would have to have two Azure Container Instances. That's actually not the case. Uh, I can use one Azure Container Instance and put multiple containers in it. Oh, in this I didn't case know two. that. Okay. Yeah. See? Cool, because yeah. the name kind of makes it sound like it's a container instance, like one. Yes, yes. So in, in essence, what it is, cool. okay. it's kind of like a pod uh, uh, that you can okay. use, like a Kubernetes pod, if you're familiar with those, yeah. that you can use to actually put multiple containers. And in okay. this case, because we have uh, two things running the same container, it's like running them on your local machine uh, where they can talk to each other. So 
Azure Container you know, instances are good for what type of applications? Like, you, you don't want to go full blown, like, you know, uh, Kubernetes, like you said. Yeah. What are they good for, like, running, like, you know, batch jobs or things like that? Yes. Of, at night or like you would normally do, but you can do them all the time now? Or what kind of scenarios would they, like, besides your demo? For container instances? Yeah. Um, I, they're really, really just good for firing things up quickly and testing and them. And testing them, okay. Yeah, so I can run this whole thing end to end in about four minutes, you okay. know, uh, in a normal uh, circumstance. But if you want to set up Kubernetes, right. uh, even on, you know, any platform, not just ours, mm -hmm. but any platform, it, you know, it's a lot more work and you have to worry about manifests and you have to worry about, uh, you know, load balancers and, and applications and interfaces and ports okay. and all kinds of things. This thing is just really, really quick and quick and dirty, if you will, a uh, way to set up a container. I want to just run this container. So if you have something you want to share with a customer or a colleague or something like that. I see. Uh, and you want to make it sure it runs before you share it, uh, you can just fire this up and then send them a link and say, here's your, here's your container instance running. Cool. So that's the kind of thing I think is the best use of this. Gotcha. Um, yeah. You can't say it works only on my machine anymore. Yes, yeah, it works on <laughs> it works Docker. It on everybody's machine. It works on Docker, that's it. <laughs> um, so basically what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to build a custom YAML based on the, uh, the variables that we okay. put together. Uh, so let's start with copying our, um, our deploy ACI YAML. So the thing called deploy ACI YAML is just a way of, it's a, it's a really simple manifest, and I'll show you an example of what okay. I'm done. Uh, and then we're going to set up the custom images here. So basically what it's doing is it's taking all the uh, environment variables that I created earlier and it's putting them into a YAML file that we can use to deploy. And if we can do a cat here or we can actually just literally uh, open the YAML file now. And it's basically got all the information. We have a local uh, location for this ACI instance the image that we're going to use from uh, our ACR instance that we created, our Azure Container uh, Registry that we created. Mm -hmm. uh, the name of the service is MicroSweeper. Uh, and then there's a little bit of information here. I did mention uh, the environment variables. So there's environment variables that you can use in Jaeger to customize your, your processing of that. Gotcha. Um, and in this case, there's just three that we had to do as a minimum. Uh, and then you start up. Uh, this is the image we're going to use, Jaeger Tracing All-in-One Latest for Jaeger. This is actually coming from Docker Hub. Uh, gotcha. So we've got our custom image, which is coming from our ACR. That's this one here. And then in the second container, we've got our Jaeger image, which is coming from Docker Hub. And once we actually run this, it's going to set all this up. It's going to open some ports. These ports are used for communicating between the traces and spans and the different agents and things that Jaeger uses to talk to, okay. to open tracing. And by the way, you can find all the in, more info on the Jaeger implementation on Docker Hub. There's all kinds of images there, and then links to the uh, GitHub repos for those images as well. So much more detail. That would be a session all by itself. <laughs> uh, so there we go. So that's that. Um, so we actually created the YAML file, and we're actually going to go ahead and just use that YAML file right down here, deploy ACI YAML. So AZ container create, it's going to create our image. Uh, it's going to use the resource group we specified. It's going to use the name of the Azure container image that we created. And it's going to use that YAML file to actually generate everything. So let's just go ahead and do that. And this actually takes a very, very small amount of time. So one question while we're waiting really yes. quick. Uh, Skull Crusher for life. Thanks for sticking around all day, dude. Hey. Um, not a Java person, but can you save a trace if you detect a problem to sort of replicate the problem and then troubleshoot it knowing all the steps it took? Yes. No. Uh, yeah. So basically, um, by default, uh, open tracing keeps everything. And you actually have to set flush intervals okay. if you want to actually get rid of anything, okay, gotcha. which is a good idea right. because uh, you know it'll store things in a variety of back-end data sources. Uh, but the main one is just HBase that it uses, which is an in-memory database on the back-end. Uh, and, and you have to flush that every once in a while. Otherwise, it'll just start to get really slow and actually slow down. Uh, well you, it doesn't slow down your application because it uses UDP. It just actually fires these things off into the ether, uh, but it will you won't get the latest stuff in your traces when you try and visualize it. So, so basically, yes, the opposite is, is actually true. You have to worry about getting rid of some of these versus collecting them. So, yeah. Yes, there is a demo of OpenShift coming up.
There's a question there. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a demo at OpenShift coming up. Yes, there will be. Stay, stay uh, here. Real quick. Stay here. Um, and I've got everything all nicely tied together, so I hope you like it. Uh, OK, so we created our instance there. Um, and then uh, basically what we're going to do here is just show the image. Uh, so we've got two things that were created here. Um, the and basically, this just shows that everything happened. So everything started. Everything's normal. Good. Uh, I won't go into the logs. The logs we're going to go into the open tracing part of it anyway. So um, in this case, I'll just grab the IP address for this particular Azure Container instance. Uh, and once again, uh, this is just a script. It uses JQ to actually grab the IP address from the properties that are returned by uh, Azure CLI call, uh, which is Azure Container Show. Uh, and then. Um, Let's see, open the application. There's the application IP address. And there it is. Once again, we got our MicroSweeper app. OK. Uh, and then we want to actually show the uh, Jaeger. So that is on port 16686 by default. 16680. Oh, there we go. Takes a second to start up. Now this time, because we had some environment variables set up, mm -hmm. uh, MicroSweeper, you remember it was Jaeger query before? Yeah. Now MicroSweeper is the name of the actual application because we named it through the environment variables. Okay, gotcha. uh, so then we can find traces, and there's just a couple of traces that I clicked a second ago. Uh, but the idea here is because this is in Azure Container Instance, everything's in the same location for you, Gotcha. which is nice. Um, OK, so that is basically everything running on a container. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, I. This is kind of the steps you would take when you're working with an application. Uh, you would work on it locally, on your local machine, running it you know, using IntelliJ or Eclipse or Visual Studio Code. You'd make sure it works, and then you want to deploy it out and share it and see if it works on a container. Uh, build your Docker file, uh, and then build your YAML file to, to deploy that. Uh, and then just run it on Azure Container Instance in this case. Now, we could take this. We could build a way more complicated manifest that actually deploys us out to Kubernetes. OK. Uh, or uh, some other container-based you know, um, uh, uh, technology. Uh, Red Hat also is one of our partners. And they've created OpenShift, which is a Kubernetes implementation which not only manages um, it's not only orchestrating the containers, but it also manages your code and stuff like that. Oh, as well. cool. So let's go ahead and show that. I already set that up. And we use the OpenShift origin image, which is actually um, a uh, open source uh, license free version of this. And as you can see here, we've been playing it a few times, trying things out. But this is the actual OpenShift. So this is MicroSweeper, uh, and this is a, actually a live IP address out there. So people can go to, there right they now. They can they can go and play and right now if they it, want yeah. to, uh, and uh, basically when they hit that, bump, 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 bump. Let's see if your app's boy. Out now. Okay, I'm, I'm winning <laughs> today, win a lot. kind of. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> that's what happens. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, it generates the the image. It stores it on Cosmos DB. So let's actually look at that. Um, oh, and then I'll show this. So. This is the MicroSweeper app. This is where the Jaeger query is. Um, and you can just refresh that, and you can find traces. So there's a trace I did just a, a few seconds ago. Uh, and looks, as you can see here, one of them is just not performing terribly well. So yeah, if, this was, a, yeah, if yeah. this was a real app, you'd want to try that out and see what the issues are. OK. Um, and let's just look at what that actually took to create. Um, in this case, uh, here's our OpenShift implementation. Uh, the actual deployment itself is under Applications Deployments. Uh, and we have uh, MicroSweeper. Jenkins is built into OpenShift. Uh, and then we have the Jaeger implementation here. And if I go into the MicroSweeper app, OK, so if I go into Environment Variables, I've set multiple environment variables for Jaeger. So I really uh, tricked this one out, basically, with all the environment variables we need. And this is actually gotcha. one of the cool features of, of MicroProfile, is there's code. There's Java code. You have to write that. But then you have your pom.xml, which manages a lot of things. And then you have the environment variables, which you can use built into your pom.xml, or you can actually use them per deployment. So when you deploy this, if I deploy this, I could have different versions of this that behave differently based on the environment variables that I set up Gotcha. Here. Yeah. Um, and um, not to make it too much of a 
um, Red Hat demo or a uh, uh, OpenShift demo, but we do have uh, builds built into this and pipelines, so that's kind of nice. Uh, and the pipelines themselves will deploy things automatically. They run some tests and things like that. So the idea here with, with uh, Red Hat OpenShift is they took Kubernetes mm -hmm. and then they take um, a version of the application that I've got running MicroProfile and they do special things with my MicroProfile app. Okay. Uh, special cloud native things like uh, back pressure, oh, circuit breakers, okay. and all kinds of cool uh, cloud native application features built into this. So uh, just wrapping back to the beginning with our actual application here, if I look at the palm.xml uh, in Visual Studio Code, let me see here, palm.xml, uh, Inside the palm.xml, I've got all kinds of things for health checks and things. And these run fine when you're running with Thorntail. Right. But then there's other things like circuit breakers and things that are just built in automatically. I didn't have to configure them in here. Uh, they will actually run and process uh, based on properties inside OpenShift. And that's, so, that, is that also because you're using a standard? You're using a standard. Yes, so I'm using micro profiles. And so it the knows micro... how to hook into all of that stuff? Is exactly. That the idea? Okay, exactly. Got it. So that's the idea. And that's kind of the, pro the promise of micro profile itself. Okay. So it's an independent, open standard. And the idea here is Red Hat can write an implementation that, of, of Kubernetes, which is another open source standard. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can actually. Um, adapt that application based on the common language that they're using between, so we can take Kubernetes, we can write some micro profile features, and then those can run. So another app server like Tommy Tribe can do similar things when they're handling micro profiles gotcha. uh, and, and other, other app platforms. So, so it, enhances, like, it enhances the life Expect expectancy of these uh, microservices. It yeah. does all, all kinds of stuff for you to, to manage them. Right, yeah. Okay. So it helps with scaling and, and management of your okay. actual application and things like that. That's actually really cool. Yeah. That's neat. So that's basically um, the session that I, I had put awesome. together. We, we watched three things. We watched uh, MicroProfile running locally, and then Azure Container Instance, and then uh, showed you the same thing running on, on OpenShift. So. Awesome, all right, yeah. um, I don't think we have any more. Oh, we do have one more question right here. Can okay. we use Visual Studio 2019 to develop Java FX projects? Oh, uh, <laughs> Visual Studio 2019 doesn't handle uh, Java necessarily. I mean, you could <laughs> implement any Angular or, or, or JavaScript-based uh, uh, portions of that project, okay. but to do the whole thing together, you'd probably want to use an IDE like IntelliJ or, so or Eclipse. Typically, Eclipse or IntelliJ is yeah. really the IDE. Yeah, NetBeans. Uh, I should NetBeans. be. Okay. I'm going to get. Right. Um, people are going to mad at me. I, I actually remember NetBeans. that name yes. from a long yes. time ago. Yes. Um, so, so VS Code's good. It's very good for quick editing and all, especially all of these files. It has nice syntax highlighting. Has yes. Really good, you know, editing experience. Um, you can still edit your Java stuff. Correct. But you. You really typically use a full-blown IDE, just like .NET developers do. They usually typically right. use a full-blown IDE, and that happens to be Visual Studio for .NET, but it yeah. happens to be Eclipse or IntelliJ for, for, for Java. Yes, yes. Okay. so Eclipse is, is sort of the, the open standard. They have a free version. IntelliJ has a free version, a community version, but they also have a paid version that a lot of big enterprises use. Uh, it's fun fact, most Enterprise Java developers, which is most Java developers, run on Windows machines. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's Everyone cool. thinks it's sort of like the Mac. So the world, development but it's not. environment is when usually Windows. It's usually okay. a Windows operating system, and then on top of that, they're either running Eclipse or IntelliJ. Okay. Uh, and uh, or NetBeans, and uh, um, you know, deployment it, is in the deployment. Linux. So okay. there's a, a lot of different features inside of Eclipse or IntelliJ that that help you manage your project interactive. Uh, breaking down projects into different, you know, segments and sharing information back to usually a Jenkins server for okay. CI. Gotcha. Uh, and then uh, we also have Azure DevOps, which works really well with Yeah, Jenkins. I was going to ask that, you yeah. know, like, so we, I mean, Ed was here earlier talking about Azure DevOps, but yep. um, a lot of great features for Java developers in, in, in that does. area as well. Right? Yeah, no, uh, uh, so uh, of course the big one is free private Git repos. Yes. Uh, that um, you can use. Uh, to build, uh, uh, you know, you, on, on other platforms uh, which are Git-based, you have to pay for private repos. Uh, for us, you don't. And then building pipelines, of course, 
uh, big advantage is if you're working with Azure on Java, um, you already are authenticated with your Azure account when mm -hmm. you're working with your projects in Azure DevOps, and it's easy to build pipelines and things. In fact, I wrote a blog a while ago that shows integration of... Uh, cool. Um, yeah, it actually shows integration of Jenkins, the, the way that you can play off Azure DevOps strengths and weaknesses. So nice. let me... Uh, uh, or while you're looking it up, we, one more question came in here. Yeah. What is your favorite VS Code, or what are your favorite VS Code plugins for Java? So oh. if you want to play with VS Code and Java, yeah. what, what are the top five let's, plugins you need? To, let's you need go to through install? my extensions. There you let's go. go through my extensions. So uh, Azure CLI Tools is a big one. The, as you can see from mm -hmm. this, I use CLI a lot. Terraform, if you want to use uh, Terraform. Uh, uh, Debugger for Java is a uh, very good That'd one. That'd be handy. Yeah. Um, yes, there is actually a Java pack. So there's an Java extension pack right okay. here that um, actually downloads all of the essentials for working with Java. And then That's there's some cool. stuff on top of that, like the CLI and Terraform, things like that, that I particularly like. Uh, Red Hat's um, Visual Studio code plugin for Java is actually the main uh, feature okay. that um, that this that everything else is based on in our extension pack. Okay. Um, so, as you can see, we work a lot with Red Hat when it comes to Java. Yeah, they're awesome. Uh, yeah, they're really good. But uh, We actually inside... work a lot with them with .NET, too. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Steel Toe. They're actually yes. on the technical steering group from the .NET Foundation, too. That's, yes. Yeah, it's, yes, it's been absolutely. great. Yeah. Well, Brian, this is super informative for me, honestly. I'm, um, I'm really happy that we have actually a lot of great tooling support, as well as Azure support for Java developers. You really opened my eyes a lot to, to that, which is great. Um, anything here. else you want to say to the audience out there? Um, no, just you know, try out our offerings for Java. Okay. Uh, and and uh, let us know. We uh, really value your feedback. You can contact me uh, on Twitter, B Benz, uh, and we actually have a Java CDA handle as well, which is Java underscore CDA, uh, and a few other. Um, uh, we have a whole team that's working on Java uh, that we've been building things. We'd like to know what people think out there in the Java world, see if uh, we're on the right track, make sure that we're building things that everyone's looking for. Cool. And um, yeah, definitely yeah. would love some feedback and let us know how we're doing and try our stuff out. It's easy to use. You don't have to learn a lot of new things. Uh, uh, there's some things that add value uh, that you can learn, but you don't have to. You can use everything as is that you're already used to working with uh, Azure as well. Cool. So, All right, yeah. Brian, thank you right. so much. All right. Thanks. so.